United States began proving just how serious they weren't about terrorism in Lebanon in the mid-1980s. The timeline of FBI history lists a great achievement on September 13, 1987, with the elaborate arrest of hijacker Fawaz Yunus. In June 1985, Yunus had been involved in two hijackings in one week. He served 18 years in prison, and during the 18 years he served in prison, nobody from the FBI, the FAA, or any government agency concerned about hijackings and airline security ever went to see him to ask him one single question. How did you do it? How did you do it? Tell me how it worked. Honestly, uh, if I explain to you and I tell you the story like, and you don't have the feeling, you look at me and you think I'm crazy. Well, I mean, well, forgive me, <laughs> taking an aircraft, eight, eight sky marshals who were armed with machines. I, I was crazy. Four guys. Honestly, I was crazy. Yeah. Believe me, it took me three minutes to have full control. Yunus, a Lebanese Shia and member of the Amal militia, received orders to hijack a Royal Jordanian Airlines flight in protest of the Palestinian presence in Lebanon. With eight Sky Marshals on board, he and his colleagues took the plane without injuring any passengers. It was a miracle to me. I don't kill nobody. It was a miracle to me. Everybody got saved. It was a miracle to me. I returned safe because I never accepted that. After holding the plane for over 24 hours and making stops at several different airports, Yunus unloaded the passengers, read a speech that explained their mission, and blew up the empty plane. He was sent into hiding in West Beirut. We got to let all the world know the truth right. and know our problems. Right. And at the time, we don't have uh, TV stations, internet. We don't have no satellite. No radio, no. We don't have no, I'm say, international radios, for example. We don't have no embassies, embassies or ambassadors all over. All we got our machine guns and our heart. Just days later, three Lebanese jihadists hijacked TWA Flight 847 in Athens. The hijacking quickly turned violent. After the plane landed in Beirut, one of the 153 passengers, Navy diver Robbie Stedham, was murdered. I was in the area when they killed him. I was, you know, I saw the body dropping on the ground. Why did they kill the diver? I believe because they tried to negotiate with the United States for the release of uh, Lebanese prisoners in Israeli jail. And the time United States sent signals they are not going to negotiate with terrorists. So had they been willing to talk, at least send a message to the Israelis, if it's possible the diver's life could have been saved? Yes, definitely, for sure. If United States at the time shown any sign for like going to negotiate or to talk to the people, the, you know, he's still alive. The man who orchestrated the hijacking was on the CIA payroll as the United States' main conduit to Iran. He had planned to rescue the people he'd ordered hijacked. This plan was now in jeopardy. How did you end up on the TWA plane? You know, because I was, uh, at the time, Amal was in full control of Beirut International Airport yeah. to protect the Beirut International Airport. Actually, we are in full control in Beirut. Amal leader Nabi Berry was the man in charge. He believed Yunus capable of bringing the TWA hijacking to a close without any more casualties. When you have five people with weapons on a plane now from Amal, so now they are in full control. Your guys are in full yes. control? Yes. Now, now are two guys from another side, this, they know that. You know, they don't they have no... They so crazy that... Right, okay. That's they right. don't have no control so at all. So basically, Barry took control of the plane. Yes, you. yes. So that was it. You took over the hijack. Yes. Okay, and the purpose was so To solve it. The CIA had their own rescue mission ready, but the CIA in Beirut disobeyed the rescue order from President Reagan. Why didn't they carry out the orders? Because Nabi Barry had been on their payroll for years, so Nabi Barry could embarrass the hell out of the U.S. government at this point. So instead, Barry orchestrated a series of negotiations with the hostages over a 17-day period. This problem, it will be finished in 24 hours. He became a very popular man in, in the politics of Lebanon and international too. He got a lot of credibility. Two years later, Yunus became a star for the Reagan administration. The one hijacker they managed to get 
was actually responsible for saving several hundred American lives. The capture of Fawaz Yunus is full of irony. The man who turned him in was CIA informant Jamal Hamdan, a petty criminal in Beirut. Jamal Hamdan goes to his case officer at the CIA and says, I can get you a terrorist. Hamdan had been a driver for Yunus years before, and now the two became partners in cigarette smuggling. After several successful trades, Jamal told Yunus he had arranged a meeting with an important buyer. This man was really an Arabic-speaking FBI agent. I never trust him, but I always in my mind thinking that, that he not going to make a mistake with me because his family in Lebanon, and he knows that for sure if anything happened to me, his family going to pay the price. What Yunus didn't know was that the CIA had agreed to bring Hamdan's entire family to the U.S. and pay them millions. We resettled the entire family at a cost of between 10 and 20 million dollars. Today, the Hamdans run a series of cigar stores in the Washington area called Cigar World. It doesn't make sense in terms of what, how we behave as a country. It could have just as easily been Eunice and his family set up here in business and the Hamdans in prison. You know, it, it was just whoever was going to cooperate and whoever was going to sell out. We put them in a position where they feel like they got nothing to lose. And that's, a, and that's a scary thing. You have to understand one thing. doesn't matter if 100% people go through screening. You have to, nobody can know what in a people's hearts. You're going to screen people's hearts and minds.